Welcome to Usability and Human Factors, Designing for Safety. This is Lecture B. In this lecture, learners will be able to 1. Apply the cognitive taxonomy of errors, 2. Define workflow analysis and methods for examining and addressing human errors. Other fields have methods of designing for safety. David Woods and colleagues described the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster as an example of how major errors happen. This includes a drift toward failure as defenses and regular procedures erode as production pressure, sticking to the schedule, increases. Taking past success as a reason for undue confidence instead of continuing to anticipate and examine points where failures could occur. New evidence accumulated. But... Assessments were not revised. Communication and coordination broke down between organizational units. Woods and colleagues provided an example on the challenger analysis and stated that responsiveness to the evidence is important in an organization's self-assessment. In addition, Woods et al describes the failure of foresight as one cause of disasters like Challenger. This is due to mental traits in which errors in other situations are viewed as too different from one's own, so lessons are not learned. Most complex processes may not initially have clear-cut evidence that a dangerous situation is emerging, so people must notice information that changes their models without it. New people, interactions, knowledge, tools, and visualizations which capture the big picture and allow reorganization of data into different perspectives can all assist in formulating a truer picture of what is happening and how it may result in unsafe conditions. In order to avoid the kind of failure of foresight involved in the Challenger disaster, Woods and others recommend building processes in which people cross-check each other's work and using different methods which can serve as cross-checks and detect possible abnormalities. Collaborations between people with different skills or perspectives can also help. Another tool is displays of how close a process is to safety margins. 100% perfection is impossible, but we can anticipate and avoid risk situations as much as possible and develop methods to handle them appropriately when they occur. Based on insights from the five patterns presented earlier, Woods advocates resilience engineering, for example, building error prevention and recovery into the system. This must be done by assessing the organization's risks and recognizing that holes in decision-making will produce drift towards the failure boundary. Technical hazards must be assessed, but with a goal of monitoring decision-making. Production pressures must be balanced to keep a schedule so that other production goals do not force ignoring safety measures. Management must be committed to all of the above and set up a system in which reporting is truly open, encouraged, and does not result in a blame culture in which people are penalized for reporting. These principles must result in a learning culture and not a culture of denial, as reflected in incident responses, which reflect preparedness and anticipation. Processes that are open and observable, rather than opaque, allow more actors to monitor situations. Flexibility, rather than stiffness and revision of procedures rather than fixation, are other requirements. Preparedness Anticipation Preparedness anticipation is the organization proactive in picking up on evidence of developing problems versus only reacting after problems become significant. Opacity observability. Opacity observability asks, does the organization monitor safely boundaries and recognize how close it is to the edge in terms of degraded defenses and barriers? In addition, it asks the question, to what extent is information about safety concerns widely distributed throughout the organization at all levels 
versus closely held by a few individuals. Flexibility stiffness. Ask how does the organization adopts to change disruptions and opportunities. Revise fixated. Revise fixated asks how the organization updates its model of vulnerabilities and the effectiveness of countermeasures over time. Resilience engineering has three basic steps. The first is detection of signs of increasing risk, especially at time of high production pressures. The next is ensuring the resources and authority to make extra investments in safety, even though it may be a time of high pressure when it may be least affordable. It is important to recognize when and where to make investments in a targeted fashion to control rising organizational risk and balance safety and production. James Reeson proposed the Swiss cheese model of system failure. Every step in a process has the potential for failure to varying degrees. The ideal system is analogous to a stack of slices of cheese. The holes are opportunities for a process to fail. Each slice is a defensive layer. An error may allow a problem to pass through a hole in one layer, but in the next layer the holes are different places, and the problem should be caught. Each layer is a defense against potential error impacting the outcome. For catastrophic error to occur, the holes need to align for each step in the process allowing all defenses to be defeated and resulting in an error. If the layers are set up with all the holes lined up, this is an inherently flawed system that will allow a problem at the beginning to progress all the way through to adversely affect the outcome. This table shows failure factors under the headings of technical, design, and organizational culture, the number of times the factors were underlying a missed, absent, or failed recovery opportunity. Distribution of cognition, which takes place not only in individual humans but across the entire system of tools, information, and people, can result in vulnerabilities that can lead to errors. Critical care is a complex environment in which clinicians are interrupted frequently. Studies by Lakshmisan showed that attendants were interrupted every 9 minutes and residents were interrupted every 14 minutes. Her study also showed that a distinguishing feature of medical expertise is that the greater the expertise, the shorter the time to detection and recovery from error. Experts had a mean time of recovery from error of 0.4 minutes, while residents took 1.5 minutes and students 3 minutes. Experts made more errors but recovered from them faster and more frequently. Errors only happen when certain things happen before. The process approaches and exceeds the boundaries of normal practice and then adverse events. Error detection and correction is poorly understood, but essential to all cognitive work. Errors happen when the boundary of acceptable practice is violated. Usually, this is corrected. An example is a medication not being prescribed at the right time. Then this omission is detected and the medication is prescribed. If someone fails to detect the omission, this can lead to an adverse event, such as progression of a clinical condition to a point where it is dangerous. At times of maximal productivity, the system may be strained. This includes straining of the cognitive capacity of the system, which may mean there are not enough cognitive resources to detect and correct the error. Workflow analysis and modeling is done by making detailed characterizations of individual workflows, identifying critical events, and then reconstructing the collective workflow from these events. This includes consideration of events which are connected in space or time and done collaboratively. One delineates the workflow, actors, devices, protocols, and communications in order to identify and focus on areas 
where tools or cognitive aids may be helpful. Next, developing a generalizable cognitive model that is applicable to other settings can be done. This slide shows the layout of a cardiothoracic ICU and the key activities that take place there with the roles of the actors. These are examples of critical zones, the activities that take place in them, and a description. The ICU is a place with a large number of adverse events and 10% average mortality. There are 5 million ICU admissions per year in the U.S. ICU admissions account for 30% of hospital costs, totaling $180 billion a year. Factors in ICU safety include the staffing level. Pronovost found that ICUs staffed with intensivists, clinicians specializing in intensive care, reduced mortality threefold. Another study found that fewer ICU nurses resulted in increased length of stay and pulmonary complications. When pharmacists were included in daily rounds, adverse drug events, ADEs, were reduced 66% from 10.4 in 1,000 to 3.5 in 1,000. General principles for error reduction include making staff accountable, reducing complexity of the system, and setting up redundancies for key processes so that they can be replaced in case of failure. This plot shows the reduction in length of stay when care goals were implemented. Methods of studying critical care environments are mostly qualitative. They include ethnographic data collection, observational studies, and the use of surveys and questionnaires. Cognitive task analyses of processes are another important technique. Van Kipuram and colleagues devised a method which uses RID, radio identification tags, kept in clinicians' pockets to analyze data on location and track where clinicians and equipment go in the ICU. The tag's location can be correlated with known patterns of what activities can occur in those locations. Thus, a software model can be built of what activities happen and what communication occurs between clinicians. This can be used to understand multiple simultaneous interactions and activities in the ICU. Also, the data can be dumped into a program which takes the data and displays the interactions that happened in a virtual world environment so that researchers can replay and view it. This slide shows the virtual world replay of collected data. Zhang and colleagues created taxonomy to classify medical errors at the individual level. This will allow us to better understand cognitive mechanisms of error, provide a framework to guide future studies, and possibly help create interventions to decrease errors. In addition, one technique that has been advocated for increasing safety is to have a national reporting system. Taxonomy of errors can assist in classifying them appropriately. Reason defines an error as the failure of achieving the intended outcome in a planned sequence of mental or physical activities when that failure is not due to chance. Not all adverse events are caused by error. For example, devices can malfunction. System problems such as delays in care caused by organizational policies or as we have seen at the beginning of this lesson by EHR implementation are not caused by individuals. Errors may be unforeseeable and non-preventable. For example, drug reactions that have never been seen in that patient before. 
Zhang and colleagues devised a system hierarchy to show the roles of human errors in medicine. What this diagram makes very clear is that every level of activity from that of the individual human being to the entire national context in which the healthcare system functions can have an effect on the likelihood of errors. For example, the regulations about the maximum number of hours residents can work at a time are designed to prevent errors due to fatigue after fatalities in the 1980s resulting from staff fatigue. The diagram at the right shows the interaction of different factors, not all of them directly connected to the individual, which eventually lead to an error. Example of an error and questions it raises from Zhang et al. 2004. This error shows that while it may appear that the individual committed a major mistake, the entire system had alterable features which could have been modified to perhaps prevent it. Asking such questions is important in redesigning systems for safety. There are more questions that should be asked. For example, why did the decimal point only work up to 99.9? .9? Design flaw? Why does the device just ignore decimal key press rather than altering the user? Why are nurses unaware of these flaws? Was this problem covered in training? There are other questions that can be asked. There are two main types of errors, slips and mistakes. Slips are errors that result from the incorrect execution of a different key on the keyboard than the one intended. Mistakes are errors that result from a correct execution of an incorrect action sequence. For example, a person who does not know the correct spelling of a word will type the word incorrectly spelled even if his typing is correct. Slips and mistakes can be further categorized according to whether they pertain to goals, intentions, action specifications, or action executions, as well as whether they are involving perception, interpretation, or evaluation. The following slides give the complete taxonomy developed by Zhang et al., as well as healthcare examples of each type of error. This is the taxonomy developed by Zhang et al. The following four slides show examples of errors classified according to the taxonomy. Interventions for preventing errors depend on the type of slip or mistake. They can include education, decision support, representational aids, information reduction, i.e. simplifying the system, display design, and device redesign. Aids for perceptual systems are important. Contrary to expectation, most errors happen at times of low productivity. Personnel in high-stress critical jobs are willing to arrange items for maximal functioning during peak times. Zhao, 1995. This concludes Lecture B of Usability and Human Factors Designing for Safety. In summary, this unit focused mainly on cognitive taxonomies in error and reviewed various studies on source of error.